This lecture is about ionic bonds. Ionic bonds are one of three categories of bonds we're going to discuss in this class. We've already talked about covalent bonds, both nonpolar and polar covalent bonds. Now we're going to talk about ionic bonds, and then after that we're going to talk about hydrogen bonds. Ionic bonds are an attraction between ions of opposite charge. And I'll talk about how those ions form during this quick lecture, and we will also talk about some other things related to electronegativity, which is going to play a role not only in ionic bonding, but we already talked about how electronegativity plays a role in covalent bonding, and it will also play a role in hydrogen bonding. So ionic bonding occurs between ions of opposite charge. Remember that opposite charges attract. So when we say opposite charge, we mean positive and negative. Again, I will talk about how those ions form, what an ion is, in a couple of minutes. It's also important to note that ionic bonds occur between metals and nonmetals. If you look at the periodic table, there's this sort of staircase shape that separates the metals from the nonmetals. And that's not hugely important to know in this class, which elements are metals versus nonmetals, but it is important to note that ionic bonding involves this. So everything in red are metals, which really shows you that most elements on the periodic table are metals. Everything in blue, those are the nonmetals. We're going to use sodium and chlorine as our example today. And you can see that sodium on this periodic table is a metal over there in column one. And then chlorine over in column seven is a non-metal. This story, as I already mentioned, is also going to involve electronegativity. So just a quick reminder about what electronegativity is. It is the pull an atom has on electrons. So if an atom has a high electronegativity, that means it has a strong pull on electrons. If it has a lower electronegativity, it means it has a lower or less pull on those electrons, a weaker pull. This is going to play an important role in a lot of things we talk about this semester. Cellular respiration, hydrogen bonding, we already talked about how it plays a role in covalent bonding. So electronegativity is a really important concept to understand. And as you'll recall, there's a trend on the periodic table in which the electronegativity increases as we move from left to right and from bottom to top on the periodic table. So everything in that upper right corner has a high electronegativity. You know, remember there are a few elements in column eight that don't really play a role in this story because they have a full outer electron shell. They're not really trying to attract electrons because they don't need to to fill an outer electron shell. But each element really has an electronegativity rating that I don't want you to concern yourselves with in this class. But when two atoms have a big difference in electronegativity, they're going to tend to form ionic bonds. And we're going to see how today when we go through this story. So electronegativity is going to play a role. Let's first talk about how ions occur. And again, I'm going to use sodium and chlorine as our examples today. Let's start with sodium. Looking at the periodic table, sodium is atomic number 11. And as you'll recall, that atomic number represents the number of protons that an atom has in the nucleus and the number of electrons that that atom has. So sodium atom has 11 protons, which are positively charged, and it has 11 electrons, which are negatively charged. So remember, in every atom on the periodic table, the number of protons equals the number of electrons, which means that those atoms have zero net charge. And again, this is a sodium atom that we're talking about. Now let's look at chlorine. Chlorine is atomic number 17. 
That means, of course, that chlorine has 17 protons, which are positively charged, and 17 electrons, which are negatively charged. So once again, chlorine has zero net charge, just as all atoms on the periodic table have no net charge. Let's look, though, at the electron configuration for each of these atoms. Now, remember that the valence shell is the outermost electron shell of an atom. And every atom needs a full outer electron shell to become stable. So that's review. Every atom needs a full valence shell, which is that outermost electron shell, to become stable. If it doesn't have a full outer electron shell, it's going to do something to fill it. We already talked in covalent bonding about how two atoms can share electrons to become stable. Today, we're going to look at a different option that atoms have in certain circumstances. Not all atoms have this, this situation occurring. They don't all have this option, but sodium and chlorine, sodium and chlorine do have this option. So let's look at the electron configuration of sodium. I'm going to just write the chemical symbol for sodium in the nucleus. We're not concerned about the number of protons or neutrons in this story. This story is really concerning the electrons. Remember that this first electron shell that's closest to the nucleus, I'm just gonna draw the nucleus really small here, has two spots available for electrons. Then the second electron shell has eight spots available. And then the next electron shell also has eight spots available. Sodium is atomic number 11, which means it has 11 electrons. And let's draw those. First two are going to be in the first electron shell. 2 plus 8 is 10. Sodium is atomic number 11, so that means it has a one electron in this outer electron shell. We also know that it has one electron in that valence shell because it's in column 1, so that would be the shortcut. Let's now look at so, uh, chlorine, sorry. Let's look at chlorine. Okay, nucleus, now first electron shell two spots, next electron shell, sorry, I should have drawn that a little smaller, eight, and then third, also eight. So chlorine is atomic number 17, that means two plus eight is 10, That means chlorine has seven electrons in that outer electron shell. Also, chlorine is in column seven, so that's the shortcut for knowing the number of valence electrons that chlorine has. Neither of these atoms have a full outer electron shell. Sodium has seven spots available that it needs to fill to become stable. Chlorine only has one open spot that it needs to fill to become stable. For sodium to share seven pairs of electrons would require a tremendous amount of energy input. It's not possible for that to happen. There's not enough energy available for that to happen. Instead, something else occurs. When sodium and chlorine come in proximity to each other, Chlorine is very electronegative. It's in the upper right corner of that periodic table. It has a very high electronegativity, meaning it has a strong pull on electrons. Sodium has that one electron in that outer shell all by itself. So when chlorine comes in proximity to sodium, it is going to steal that electron from sodium. And that electron 
is going to fill the outer electron shell for chlorine. So chlorine now has a full outer electron shell. Sodium gave that electron away. It doesn't have it anymore. In fact, once that electron's gone, it doesn't have that third shell anymore either. So now sodium has a full outer electron shell because that second shell becomes its valent shell. And it's now full. So both atoms now are stable. But guess what? They're not called atoms anymore. And the reason for that is they no longer have an equal number of protons and electrons. They are no longer electrically neutral. Let's look at what happened to sodium first. So sodium did have 11 protons and 11 electrons. The number of protons cannot change. If that changed, it would be a completely different atom because that is what defines the atomic number of the atom and what type of element we're looking at. So sodium still has 11 protons, but it gave an electron away to chlorine. So you can either say 11 minus one is 10, or you can just count that there are 10 electrons now shown on that electron configuration diagram of sodium. So it now has 10 electrons. Now they're no longer equal. So sodium now has a net electrical charge of plus one because it has one more proton than it does electrons. They're no longer equal. This is now what we call a sodium ion. And it's written with a superscript plus. Remember in chemistry, we don't write a plus one or we don't write a one next to something in a chemical equation where there's just one. If something's written alone, it implies the number one. If it had a plus two charge or a plus three charge, we would write that number. For one, we just write the plus. Let's look at what happened to chlorine. Chlorine, atomic number 17, 17 protons, 17 electrons. It gained an electron. So it's still going to have 17 protons, but now it gained an electron. You can either do the math or you can count that that's now 18 negatively charged particles. So now there's one more electron than protons, which is going to give this a minus one charge. It's now what we call a chloride ion. And we write that as a superscript minus. Again, we don't write the one. If it was a minus two, we would write the two, but because it's a minus one, we just write the minus sign. Now, these are what are called ions, and they are now weakly attracted to each other due to that opposite charge attracting. So the way that looks is sodium ion, and chlorine ion come in contact with each other and through ionic bonding, attraction between ions of opposite charge, they are now going to form the compound, which is what we call when two ions come together through ionic bonding, we call this a compound. And this compound is called sodium chloride otherwise known as table salt. This is the salt you get in a salt shaker. So attraction between ions of opposite charge. That plus one and minus one cancel each other out when they're connected together. So it's almost like this. They're not connected like this in covalent bonding. They're sharing electrons. They're really tightly connected. This is more an attraction between these two separate atoms. Sorry, I kind of look like something weird is happening right now in the video, but you get what I'm saying. So attraction between ions of opposite charge. Sodium and chlorine come together to form this compound. Also important to note that when this is mixed with water, you're going to see when we talk about properties of water, these two are going to separate 
back into ions again. So this sodium chloride would not occur in a solid form in the body. When it's mixed with water, it dissolves. And you know that because you know you can mix salt with water. And these ions in the body are going to play a very important role in our physiology that we will talk about when we discuss properties of water. We will talk about these ions when we talk about transport across cell membranes. So ions are really important to understand. In an ion, the number of protons and the number of neutrons are not equal. So ions, number of protons does not equal the number of electrons. And there is a net electrical charge. Positively charged ions are called cations. I always think that's kind of funny because I think of cats as not being so positive all the time. <laughs> That's not what it means. It's not talking about the animal, a cat. And negatively charged ions are anions. So really, an ionic bond occurs between a cation and an anion. This doesn't just occur between sodium and chlorine. If you take a higher level biology class or chemistry class, you, you can look at more details of what other elements come together, but it's always a metal and a non-metal. And so in other words, it's always something really electronegative coming together with something that's not as electronegative. So if there's a really big difference in electronegativity between two atoms, so something in column one, something in column seven, they're going to tend to form an ionic bond. So that is ionic bonds.